Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, as you know, the first session on a Sunday morning is always called a graveyard slot, and it's very appropriate to my topic uh, this morning. But uh, thank you, thank you so much for coming, and thanks to Peter for a wonderful talk. It was absolutely fascinating, and a terrific background against which some of the issues that I'm going to raise. I mean, it, as Danielle said, the intersections between art and history, uh, but that background of the the survey of Ireland. Uh, going on while um, the country was um, was being ravaged. Uh, could I ask how many people have been to see the exhibition, just as a matter of interest? So quite quite a number. Um, and I don't know whether any of you have been on tours that I've given. So I'll try not to repeat too much. So, I mean, you'll be seeing some of the same images, but hopefully with some different commentary. So what I'd like to do is start uh, and talk a little bit about the... I'll just show you a few images of the museum itself and uh, to talk a little bit about the history and then move to the art and then move back to the history and so on and so, so forth. So there may be people here who are deeply knowledgeable about the famine uh, and there may be people here who are deeply knowledgeable about art, but I'm going to try and bring the two together. And if there are people who know both, maybe they don't need to be here at all. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so um, Ireland's Great Hunger Museum was established uh, six years ago, only six years ago. So it's a fledgling museum. But I think that um, what has been achieved in that time is, is quite remarkable. And the response to um, the museum in the form of um, the collection that we brought to Ireland that is touring Ireland for most of 2018 into 2019 has been absolutely staggering. I mean, we are amazed at the response. We had almost 60,000 people in Dublin and um, close on 15,000 people already after only four weeks in, uh, in Skibbereen. So 75,000 people um, in, 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 a, in a short number of months. So that is quite interesting. And I think it's worth asking questions about what is it that is, is appealing to people so, quite so profoundly. So just a few quick interior shots. This is the upstairs of the museum. It's on two floors, and there's a glass atrium, which you can see projecting out there to the side. It's a very contemporary, modern, uh, stylish space. We had fantastic architects. And what, one of the things that was most fascinating for me was that as we were building the museum, we were acquiring the art. So we were able to adapt the space rather than saying, oh, well, that's going to have to fit there because it's that size. We were able to uh, adapt the space to the art. So the, the massive, I think I have a shot at it. Uh, It'll, it's certainly coming up later, the massive uh, Michael Farrell painting, Black 47, and it has a raking light uh, coming through it. Um, and we were able to replicate that with an actual window of the museum so that it appears as if this shaft of light is very, it has a very kind of filmic effect. So uh, we were able to do some interesting things with the building, even though it is a small museum. Now, um, the power of the image should not be underrated. Images concretize the past and are a form of proof that events written about took place, but they are not the wallpaper of history. Uh, images, people are uh, emotionally engaged by images. They've been known to kiss them, cry before them, laugh at them, be aroused by them, deface them, be inspired by them, worship them, fear them. Only a couple of years ago in Paris, a cartoon image provoked a frightful spate of carnage by assassins who saw no difference between the image and the prophet. Iconoclasm in art history led to extraordinary violence when places of worship were raised to the ground, and indeed continues today, leading to extraordinary violence when places of worship, sorry, excuse me, um, uh, sorry, let me say that sentence again, led to extraordinary violence when places of worship were raised to the ground and images smashed and burned. Actually, more art has been destroyed in the name of religion than has survived. In our own day, the Paris killers believed that the Charlie illustrations were an incarnation and that there was no distinction between the image and the deity it represented. Proof, indeed, of the power of the image. But what happens when an event occurs that is, to all intents and purposes, unrepresentable? And that's the question for us with regards to the famine. Now, in Ireland, in uh, 1791, the population was 4 million. In 1841, only 50 years later, the population was over 8 million. And in 
1891, it had reverted to 4.7 million. Over a million died during the famine, and both during and in the immediate aftermath, one and a half million emigrated, followed by a further two and a half million emigrations to the end of the 19th century. So by the end of the 19th century, half the population of the entire country was gone. That's an extraordinary demographic by any standards. And the consequences, the experience for those who endured those, uh, those years and the consequences for those who left behind were quite extraordinary. The majority, as we know, was employed on the land by, uh, that was owned by a tiny minority of landlords. Following the Act of Union in 1800, a succession is that something I'm doing? A succession of crises resulted in a perpetual state of emergency. The fallout out from the 1798 rebellion, bitter sectarianism over Catholic emancipation and the tithe wars, high food prices, low wages, exacerbated by the post-Napoleonic economic crash. A series of shorter but nonetheless deadly fam famines in 1871 and 1822 and an outbreak of cholera in 1832. Previously, there had been 27 total or partial fa failures of the potato crop, but the great hunger was remarkable for its longevity and scale. Cyclical shortages had caused immense hardship and people died, but because they weren't sequential, people were, there was a time for recovery before the next shortage occurred. The problem with the great hunger was that for seven years, one year after the other, there was either total, total or partial failures and the effects were cumulative. So the calamity of the mid-19th century of the Great Famine is best understood as a process of disintegration rather than as a seven-year event in itself, an outcome of systematic neglect by government. Appalling living conditions were the breeding ground for the single greatest loss of life in Europe between the Napoleonic Wars and the First World War. There is no bigger uh, um, catastrophe, demographic catastrophe than the Great Famine. It occasions some of the most searing accounts of living conditions, but its visual history is more complicated. Uh, just pausing now for a minute, and I want to just talk a little bit about the art of the period. So in 1840, in the 1840s, um, you will all know from your visits to various national galleries, the Louvre, all the sort of standard museums that show European art of this period. Um, the, there was a thing in art called the hierarchy of genres, and it is important to understand how artists were trained and what they were trained to do. So artists studied in academies, in the Royal Academy in London, in the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, in the various academies in, um, in Berlin and in Munich and so on. And they studied in a very particular formalized and rigid way. It took about seven years to become an artist. And they started by learning to draw um, uh, from, from classical casts. So not drawing from real life, but drawing from casts. So, you know, the arm of Athene, the nose of Apollo, whatever, and only drawing skills. They were not allowed near the live model for about two to three years. Now, the effect of the, this is that you had huge control. You know, the, the, the extent to which you could render form was, was very uh, developed and very accurate, but very prescribed. So they were trained to see in a very idealized way. They were not looking at the bodies of ordinary people, of people who were overweight or too old or too young or too whatever. These are idealized um, Greco-Roman models. Uh, at the end of the seven-year period, artists produced what was called a reception piece, and it went to the academy to which they were applying, so the Royal Academy in London or, the, um, or, or in Paris. And uh, the academicians then decided uh, what kind of artist you were going to be. So you couldn't decide to be a history painter or a portrait painter or a landscape painter. You were designated according to the skills that they understood you to have. So artists, the, the, the apex was history painting. Now, history painting was not necessarily the painting of history, although it was that. But it was also the painting of mythology and religion and any of the kind of the grand subjects that required education to understand. And this is what every artist wanted to be. So through this process, you could become a painter to the king or the court, or you, know, you were able to paint work that would be purchased at the great academies um, and hung in the great homes of, uh, of the, the wealthy and the powerful. Uh, if you didn't make it as a history painter, the next tier was as a portrait painter, 
or a landscape painter. Now, um, portrait painting and landscape painting, uh, we, we've seen so many examples of them in so many galleries, but it would be a mistake to ever view them as innocent uh, because they were really statements about who was in control and what they were in control of. So the big figures, the portraits of, um, at this period, wealthy industrialists, um, princes of the, of the court, um, government ministers, important people with power. And landscapes were of their possessions. So when we look at paintings, um, let's see if it's the next one coming up. When we see paintings, I'll just go on for one minute, uh, uh, such as this. It is not simply, um, you know, a beautiful painting of a beautiful place, but it's usually commissioned by a landlord to show how much he owns and the scale of his possessions. So this is the, the, uh, the way we should read um, portraiture and landscape at the time. So um, that is the, the kind of the formation of artists. So... Go back then to something like uh, the conditions that pertained in Ireland at the time. Artists of this period did not paint ordinary, everyday people. They painted religious paintings, mythological paintings, um, and uh, historical paintings, but always of events well in the past, not contemporary history. That was never addressed. So that is the hierarchy of subject matter and the training of artists as it pertained in the 1840s. Now, um, of landlords, the people who were commissioning the paintings in Ireland, Arthur Young, a visitor to Ireland, reported, nothing satisfies him but an unlimited submission. Disrespect or anything tending towards saltiness, he may punish with his cane or his horsewhip. Many of their cottiers would think themselves honoured to have their wives or daughters sent for to the bed of the master. A mark of slavery that proves the, oppres uh, the oppression under which such people must live. Visiting Ireland on the eve of the fam famine, Frederick Douglass, so much to remind him of his former life, of all the places to witness ignorance, degradation, filth and wretched wretchedness, an Irish hut is preeminent. The peasant, he believed, lived in much the same degradation as American slaves. <coughs> The Times, the London Times, in keeping with colonial stereotypes, blamed the victims. A wretched, indolent, half-starved tribe of savages, they wrote. But while a small number of contemporary paintings of conditions during the famine period, so, you know, so we, we do have some, uh, not a huge number, but we do have some paintings of, of um, the, the huts in which people, the cabins or small houses in which people lived, um, scenes of eviction uh, and scenes of poverty. They begin to creep into the art of the period, but there are a limited number of them. However, this painting by Daniel MacDonald, the Cork artist Daniel MacDonald, called Irish Peasant Family Discovering the Blight of Their Store, is unique. The panic that had set in by 1847 explains the heightened pitch of the painting. Victorian painting was hierarchical, as I've explained in subject matter, technically very controlled and restrained in sentiment. Given MacDonald's acknowledged graphic and painterly skills, the terribilita of the work was not the result of an inability to control medium or message, but an attempt to depict the horror. So it is kind of overblown because he's trying to, how do you, how do you communicate what is happening? It doesn't, it can't just be, you know, um, a modest family in their, on their potato patch and just discovering that the blight, you have to convey the horror of it. And this is how he did it. So there are those who feel that it is very overblown, but how else do you depict the horror? So these are some of the difficulties that artists had in representing it. The subject matter was ominous. The scene may seem overwrought, but is not travestied. And there were no visual precedents. So there is no work before this that deals with this kind of subject matter. I can't think of a single one of a contemporary event uh, that uh, any artist tried to do before, uh, before this painting. Um, so here we see uh, the diseased potatoes are strewn, the slain is cast down, the sun is setting and the storm is closing in. But there is almost a sense of otherworldly keening in the air, recalling Thomas Davis's words. Think of the long, long patience of the people, their huts, their hunger, 
their disease. Oh, how they cross us like banshees when we would range free on the mountain. So again, a more poetic way of trying to, uh, you know, uh, empathize with uh, what was happening at the time. Now, in 1847, the date of this painting, coincidentally the peak of the, the famine, Black 47, Edouard Manet, the French artist, called on painters to paint what they see, not what they know. Although the hierarchy of genres, with history painting at the apex, did not allow ordinary people serious treatment in art. In 1848, the year of revolutions in Europe, the call for political representation for and of the people was, was made. And this led Gustave Courbet to break the mould. Uh, strikingly, Daniel MacDonald, um, Daniel MacDonald's painting predates the Courbet painting. And Courbet is standardly credited with the first artist who de dealt with the peasant in any kind of heroic scale. Now, previously, if you think of a lot of landscapes by Gainsborough and so on, you'll see a little peasant in the painting. But he's not there to be represented as a peasant. He's there to give what we call staffage. He's there to establish the scale of the landscape and the importance of the landscape and who owned it and what it says about the person who owned it. For the first time with the three great French realists, but predated um, by Daniel MacDonald, the peasant is aggrandized and shown on a full scale on a painting and treated as if he was the most important person in the salon. Um, nevertheless, um, even with the advent of realism, so the work of Courbet and Daumier and Millet, um, even with their breaking new ground stylistically, even realism was incapable of pictorializing an epic catastrophe such as the famine. So it's ordinary people that they show, and that in itself was very radical. But to be able to show the scale of something which has huge political um, history to it, which has huge, huge political causes and very deep um, issues concerned with uh, power and authority and the withholding of relief to people uh, who could have been saved. So it has been established by historians that there was almost enough food in the country to have fed everybody. Not quite, but almost. And yet it was withheld. One million died, over one million died, and over one and a half million emigrated. So there are very deep causes and consequences to be considered. And the neutral representation of landscape or of peasants in a landscape cannot really tell that story convincingly. But in Henry Mark Anthony's, um, sorry, yes, one of the other points I wanted to make in relation to Daniel MacDonald is that one of the questions that people very often ask is that why, why was there no um, uh, resistance? Now, um, I have got that slide slightly out of place, so I think I will come back to it uh, in a minute. Um, th this is a faction fight, and um, it is a form of social control that the Irish uh, used to, to um, moderate uh, behaviour amongst themselves. So obviously the Irish peasants um, deeply mistrusted the authorities and any issues that arose between them they tended to hold in reserve until the faction fights were called and uh, these were um, scheduled to take place throughout the year around the time of a fair or a pattern, uh, you know, the feast day of a saint or so on. And Different areas, different um, villages and different kind of groups of villages had individuals, captains, as they were called, um, who did a lot of this social control. And it was the captains who would decide when a faction fight was going to take place. So all the kind of resentments of the year, Romeo and Juliet type feuds, people who stole a few potatoes from somebody else, um, land grabbing, any of these issues were dealt with were reserved until a faction fight was called. And they were extremely, um, uh, they, 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 they were, they're often described as random acts of violence, the Irish being violent and savages, but absolutely not random at all. They were very controlled. The captains would announce the day when the fight would take place. And people would come out of their hovels up and down the mountains and around the rivers, all come together. They would line up on two sides, uh, with a sort of no man's ma land in between. The captains would stomp up and down this no man's land, 
hurtling abuse at the other side, but holding his own side back until they could contain it no more. And then they let them go. They laid into each other in one faction fight in 1829. 20 people were killed. But if the authorities came upon them without a word, they, two sides joined together and attacked the authorities. But this was the only form, really, of internal regulation that occurred. And, and the interesting thing also is that if the fighting was done with sticks and they, were, and they practiced it and they honed their skills and they, they were deadly weapons. And it was the only way that a downtrodden people could could train themselves, you know, to keep their skills um, attuned for what would become the business of the nation later. Now, um, uh, this painting uh, is in the exhibition. It's Henry Mark Anthony's Sunset. Um, it, it's a fascinating painting, and it's an extremely important painting, both historically and uh, aesthetically. Um, we paid less for this than for any other painting in the collection, and yet I think it is probably the most important. Um, now, I would uh, venture to suggest that nobody here has ever heard of Henry Mark Anthony, and yet in his own day he was described as uh, far better than Constable, at least as good as Turner. Uh, Ford Maddox Brown and all the pre-Raphaelites um, uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti and um, William Holman Hunt, they revered him. He was the first British artist to go to Paris to study in the École de Beaux-Arts in the 1830s. And he came back with an extraordinarily radical style. Now, if you think of some of those landscape paintings, I showed you one earlier, uh, or all the paintings that you would have seen yourselves from this period, you never see a brushstroke. So the colour is blended on the palette before, and the brush strokes are blended so you don't see a brush stroke because it's almost, we're, we're talking pre-photographic days, but the painting was almost to give a sense that it was photographic. So the artist was not allowed to draw attention to the fact that it was art. But when Henry Mark Anthony came back from, um, from, uh, from Paris, now we're talking, he came back in the late 1830s. So nearly 40 years before the first Impressionist exhibition in 1874. And yet, what he was doing, it's difficult to see now in a slide, you'd want to see it in the original. If you look at the sky, it is almost impressionist. The brush strokes are individualized, you can see them on the canvas. The, the blending of the color takes place in the retina of the eye, not on the palette. It's very, very radical painting. It's extraordinarily radical for its time. And he was both revered and mistrusted for it. So every single newspaper review, and there were hundreds of them, of his work, they all describe him as a genius. Now, some say that in a very acclamatory um, way, and some say it in quite, a radical, or in quite a negative way. They say he really would want to watch it. He is a genius, but he's too mannered. So there is this tension going on uh, in relation to the reception of his work. So that's the stylistic, aesthetic side of it, very radical. And then beneath, in the lower register of the painting, we see that he is honed in on the... It looks quite fuzzy to me here. Can you see that clearly? Is there too much light in the room? Uh, you can see that um, the peasants... Uh, you can see the dwellings of the peasants. Now, these houses are actually quite grand compared to the houses in which most people lived. We know that in... Um, generally, these are houses, small houses, hovels maybe, but most people lived in cabins, which weren't even houses. So they were houses built with, um, you know, turf and um, bits of driftwood and whatever they could find lying around, sometimes just propped up against a ditch. Um, most of them had no windows, no chimney. The door was three foot high. You actually had to bend down to climb in. Up to 12, between 12 and 14 people commonly lived in one of these hovels eight foot long by six foot wide. I mean, they were almost living standing up in the pitch dark. And these were the conditions in which most people, the majority of the peasants lived. So uh, the, the peasants, the, the scene that he shows here is quite, um, thank you, is that better? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the scene is, um, is better than most, but still, I cannot think of another painting that is showing the conditions in which people lived quite so clearly before this period. Now, where's my little thing here? So in this doorway here, uh, in the real painting or in a, a you know, if we'd less uh, light in the room, there are eight people in that doorway and they're all peering out. 
and the same in, in all of the other, other ones. So showing the huge, the overcrowding, the terrible conditions in which people lived. And here, of course, we have a house where the roof has been what was called tumbled. So when people had been evicted, so on top of the one million deaths, the one and a half million emigrations, 750,000 people um, uh, were evicted during this period. Some of them, there are extraordinarily cruel and vicious evictions. Um, one estate evicted 700 people on Christmas Eve uh, one year, just out onto the, the, the side of the road. And if they couldn't get to the workhouse or they didn't make it to there, they died on the side of the road. So the, the conditions in which people lived and died were simply unspeakable. Um, Henry, uh, Mary Howitt, the Victorian writer, perceived in Henry Mark Anthony's work what she called the crushed and bleeding soul of the Irish people. So here, the ruins of the Rock of Cashel tower over the more recent ruins of a society on the verge of collapse. The abject poverty of the countryside in which the ruins stood show the condition into which that civilization had sunk. So here we see both the aesthetic and political pressures placed on conventional art by deeply troubling subject matter. Artists tended to fall back on stock imagery relating to the Irish scenery and character. It's precisely against this backdrop that works such as this break new ground. So it, it probably doesn't seem that radical to us, but at the time it was extraordinarily radical. By the way, the reason why you've never heard of him was that he was just about to be made an academician. He was, um, you know, being lauded and uh, acclaimed all over the place. And then there was a huge scandal. So he seduced his maid and uh, accused his wife of stealing the booze uh, so he could justify his own behaviour. She, uh, and he beat her up quite savagely, uh, she sued for divorce, and at a time when divorce was very rare, there were huge accounts of uh, long, lengthy pages of the divorce of Anthony versus Anthony that people just couldn't get enough of, and then chop, he was out of the academy, and that was the end of him. Um, anyway, the story of the great hunger has been told in words. Prior to the establishment of Ireland's Great Hunger Museum, no institution had borne witness visually to the greatest demographic, demographic catastrophe of the 19th century. Those who experienced the devastation did so, at least initially, with their eyes. They saw their own food rot in the soil. They saw the food they cultivated for others exported while they starved. They saw their homes razed to the ground by landlords for whom they'd worked all their lives. They saw their mothers and fathers and children uh, die, and they saw their country received. As dispossessed, they fled. Sites that were etched in memory, but seldom found visual expression. Here we see the ruins, Movine, and what was left of it when an eviction such as I described a few minutes ago, took place. And of course, what they did was they removed the roof so that uh, no, so the family couldn't go back in uh, or another family couldn't take it. So this was the remains. that These were the, these were the villages that um, were found over and over uh, the countryside at the time. In 1847, the social activist and humanitarian from Connecticut, Ella Hugh Burrett, visited Skibbereen. His accounts of famine spectres half naked and standing or sitting in the mud, struggling forward with their rusty tin and iron vessels for soup, some of them, as he said, upon all fours like famished beasts. These accounts, his written accounts, are really harrowing. They make their extraordinarily powerful reading. Burrett spoke of fevered, naked, breathing skeletons. Had their bones been divested of the skin that held them together, he said, they would not have been more visible an appearance seldom paralleled this side of the grave. He found a small shed in this horrible den of death. Living men, women and children went down to die, to pillow upon the rotten straw, the grave clothes, vacated by preceding victims and festering with their fever. Here they lay as closely to each other as if crowded side by side on the bottom of one grave. Descriptions of malnutrition just let me see where I am here now. Uh, descriptions, this is Eliyahu Burrett. Uh, descriptions of malnutrition, tooth loss, swollen joints, distended stomachs and bursting blood vessels defied representation. And it was not just the physical effects, whatever about the horrors of cannibalism or dogs feeding on dead bodies. Skibbereen doctor Daniel Donovan described mothers snatching food from their starving children. 
he knew a son who killed his father for a potato. And he saw parents look on the putrid bodies of their offspring without a flicker of emotion. Donovan described how the faces and limbs become frightfully emaciated. The eyes acquired a most peculiar stare. The skin exhaled a peculiar and offensive feature and was covered with a brownish, filthy-looking coating, almost as indelible as varnish. But in Nichols' simianized painting, the brown epidermis reinforces the notion of the unwashed Irish. So when I first saw this painting, I was very puzzled about this and other paintings, where when I saw this brown skin, and I thought, you know, what is this? Is this trying to convey that the, you know, the view of the Irish are lazy and indolent and, you know, hanging about out in the sun, getting, you know, nicely tanned. And, but it was only when I read Donovan's description that I realized it, were, it was what was happening to the body as it was disintegrating, as it was, you know, eating itself. Um, so the, these pictures are quite extraordinary. Now, um, the racialization of poverty justified government policy on the famine. So um, you've all heard two, two phenomena come into play here. Um, you've, we, we know about laissez-faire economics, letting the market decide, and that is why the government did not intervene to um, save uh, the starving, even though they could have, by ceasing the, um, the practice of exporting food at the same time. But there was also uh, two other things. There was providentialism, which is the idea that God sent the famine, and who are we to interrupt or, you know, go against his will. So one of the great justifications was this idea that it was the will of God sent to punish the Irish for their laziness and their indolence and their dirt and their filth and their wretchedness. So, um, in, uh, if, so if we look at these, if you, if you look at the three, oh, sorry, wait now. If you look at the three, particularly the three characters back here, um, simultaneously, the pseudoscience of phrenology was gaining credibility in tandem, uh, parallel to uh, evolutionary theory. The notion that man's moral and intellectual development could be read from his physiognomy in, culminated in what the pseudoscience called an index of negrescence. In this index of negrescence, and they did, they measured everybody, the calipers, and they measured the foreheads and the width from here to here and the sticking out jaw, and all of these went to show uh, how low on the evolutionary scale the Irish were. So the Irish were placed at the bottom of the scale, close to cro man and uh, the Africanoid races. And indeed, there were those who believed that the Irish were the missing link. Uh, Charles Kingsley, a number of you here may have read The Water Babies when you were young. Charles Kingsley described coming to Ireland and being utterly shocked by the white chimpanzees he saw on the side of the road. So this was common parlance at the time. And it was very powerful justification for British responses to the famine at the time. So the prognathous jaw and the low forehead confirming low evolutionary status supposedly explained Irish degeneracy and criminality. Now, the blight culled the land, uh, culled the people and cleared the land. And there were even those quite intelligent, um, you know, um, learned people who thought that not enough people had died in the famine because it was of enormous assistance to um, landlords who wanted to change the system of agriculture, changing to uh, pasturage uh, in Ireland. There were simply far too many people, and uh, they, were, they just needed to be eliminated. So this was done by people dying off themselves very conveniently, or by being exported uh, on, in many cases, not always, but in many cases on famine ships uh, to the States in particular. So... Um, the, the blight called the people and cleared the land. Charles Trevelyan, Assistant Secretary to the Treasury and Chief Administrator of Famine Relief, concluded, the judgment of God sent the calamity to teach the Irish a lesson. That calamity must not be too much mitigated. The real evil with which we have to contend is not the physical evil of the famine, but the moral evil of the selfish, perverse and turbulent character of the people. So these are very justificatory responses. Now, the consequences of... Let me see where I am here. I keep forgetting. Um, so just very quickly, uh, we get lots of these kind of images in the pictorial newspapers of the day. Idiot and mother. 
uh, Connacht man. So this is the kind of the simianized um, character that became so prevalent, you know, all the, the punch magazines and so on, but that it actually entered into the cultural lexicon of fine art painting and was shown in the salons of the Royal Academy is quite extraordinary. And people loved Nicholas work. He painted over a hundred of those paintings that I showed you and people really did like them. Got great reviews. There's Trevelyan here. Now, um, The consequences of insisting that the landlord be paid regardless of the need to eat and exporting vast amounts of food to England were not hard to foresee. Um, actually, that, sorry, excuse me, I am sorry about this. That this is where I was going to talk about the faction fighter, so we've done that. Now, we've all read the horrible descriptions, how little boys and girls, for example, presented a hideous sight, their heads bald and their faces wrinkled like old men and women of 70 or 80 years of age. And, of course, as people really were dying of starvation, one of the features was hair growing on the face. So all of these things were sort of... Um, maximized for justificatory um, explanation for British responses to the famine. In his study of homicidal starvation, as Alfred Swain Taylor um, uh, wrote, um, he concluded that life commonly terminated in a fit of maniacal delirium. So finally, there is this extraordinary delirium. Now, etched in memory, yes, but these kind of things could not be represented. The artists did not have the skill to do it. They wouldn't have known how to do it. And anyway, if they had, would anybody have bought those paintings? So artists painted for elite audiences and the people that they painted for would not have countenanced buying, potato, buying paintings of you know, rotting um, potatoes and starving bodies and diseased people. So there was going to be no um, audience for the kind of work that we're talking about. So those who witnessed the great hunger or survived it would have considered it improper to represent it or to elevate it to the condition of art. Nevertheless, there are some powerful images that tell aspects of the story, while others are more tellingly expressed by their absence, as it were. Historically in art, violence or distress was softened for the sensibilities of the rich, distanced in time, are cloaked in mythology or allegory. Artists, as I explained, were trained to paint in a classical manner, their skills honed in the antique class before studying the live model, by which time they were attuned to see the humanized body in an idealized way. So how then was the famine represented? Most artists addressed the famine tangentially, allegorically or symbolically culturally encoding their images to indirectly reflect events, behaviours and ideologies rather than addressing it head on, as did Daniel MacLeese in his 1854 Marriage of Strongbow and Aoife. Aoife personifies Ireland, Strongbow England. Her beauty and culture contrast with his power and violence. The massacred bodies signal the death of a people and a culture and suggest the storm clouds in the painting may be as much about recent history the famine, as events in the distant past. The Act of Union in 1800 had led to the exodus of the art purchasing class from Ireland, and Irish artists who had not already done so followed them to London. Um, so even if the will existed to paint such subject matter, there were deeply rooted cultural obstacles to overcome. So if hunger was difficult to represent in fine art terms, how did people around the world learn of what was happening in Ireland during those years? The famine coincided with the birth of mass-produced illustrated newspapers. And here we find the visual record of the great hunger. No known photographs of the famine exist. In their stead, illustration assumed documentary power and took on the mantle of authority. In the hands of a native illustrator, such as James Mahoney from Cork, uh, however, the struggle to convey the reality was mitigated by the desire to reveal the horror endured by the poor of Ireland without compromising their humanity. So accounts of uh, a family struggling to a graveyard to entomb themselves in a small shed because there would be no one left to bury them when they were gone were beyond his visual powers. 
but Mahoney would have thought it indecent to even try. His pictorial device, the closed door, and the back view of the victims occluded the effects of famine on dying bodies. So the eloquence of his images, in a sense, lies in their restraint, in the very fact that he didn't try to describe it. So we have to read out from, uh, from these images. Now, um, I'm going to move on a little bit because I think I'm going to. Yeah. So um, I just want to briefly address the issue of the great silence that we hear about. Uh, this is a common um, uh, description and a common um, notion about the Great Famine, that it was followed by a great silence. But I think that is more to do with the nature of historiography itself, um, because history, um, hi the history at the time was of great deeds of great men. The peasant really didn't feature in history. So I don't think it was necessarily a deliberate silence. And I don't believe that nobody amongst themselves didn't speak of the famine. We know so much from, uh, from folklore and from um, oral history and so on that, of course, these things were um, you know, addressed in their own way through, through story and through song and through poetry and so on. But the, the nature of history was itself problematic. Um, I, I, I was very amused by Terry Deary. I don't know if anybody here read the Horrible History series. Um, and uh, he was asked by somebody, who did he most admire in history? And he said, Mr. and Mrs. Peasant, the unsung heroes of history. And th this really is their, their story. So I think that is really what happened. But in 1885, in lamenting the loss of culture of the Métis people of Canada, Louis Riel, who actually has an Irish background, uh, he that was their political and spiritual leader. And he predicted, my people will sleep for a 100 years, but when they awake, it will be the artists who give them back their spirit. And to an extent, so uh, it was in Ireland. In 1945, uh, the 1945 centenary of the famine saw the first attempts to bring the famine back into the visual imagination. But it was not until the 150th anniversary in the mid-1990s that the image, in a sense, finally caught up with history. As time passes, remembrance becomes more elusive. David Reef suggests that the essence of historical remembrance consists of identification and psychological proximity to the event rather than accuracy, let alone historical nuance and depth. In the case of post-famine generations, the opportunity to represent it aesthetically had to await changes in visual style that could absorb unsettling historical subject matter. As you can imagine, the immediacy and charm and spontaneity of Impressionism uh, did not lend itself to images of disease and hunger and death. So, the painting iconic of the famine is Lillian Lucy Davidson's Goethe, 1946. It assaults audiences visually and psychologically. The restricted palette intensifies the emotion. Blue has a long tradition in Christian iconography and is associated with mourning. This family has lost everything, but there is no redemption. Beckett-like, all narrative is eliminated. They have come from nothing and now traumatized. They look past one another into nothingness. And the way she has done that is she set the burial in a killeen. So it's the, the burial of a dead child, mother, father, and grandfather. And uh, uh, the, the, the metaphor that she uses is that the child has been buried in a killeen, which is an unconsecrated burial ground. So... There is no hope. There has been no meaning and there is no hope. Uh, such was the impact of the famine. So the point of the present exhibition uh, that in, is in Skibbereen at the moment is not just to represent the great hunger, but to contextualize it and place it in its wider cultural and historical settings. James Mahoney. Uh, James Mahoney's consecration of the Roman Catholic Church of St. Mary's, Pope's Key, Cork, for example, shows the determination of the Catholic Church to establish its authority within a disorientated culture. I'm also fascinated that a painting such as this could have been painted uh, less than 10 years after the granting of Catholic emancipation. So I'm still trying to get to the records from the church as to where they got the money to do something as elaborate as this. This it was a fabulous uh, church at the time. I mean, its elaboration um, was, was quite remarkable. Um, equally, Jack B. Yeats' uh, landscape of Derry Nan is imbued with the memory of Daniel O'Connell, whose house was actually in our space here, um, both as politician and landlord in the immediate pre-famine period. The 
multiple narratives in um, Michael Farrell's massive Black 47. This is a huge painting, 14 feet by 12 feet, in which a raking light shows Charles Trevelyan in the dock, where he never was, unfortunately, before a jury of the dead arraigned, arraigned for his mismanagement of the Fallon. In his apocalyptic departure, Porrick Rainey depicts a human procession crossing a bloodied potato field, the uncoffined dead lying in shallow graves beneath the, fa- the feet of the living, the living on the long march towards a famine ship and exile. John Cole's hollowed figures carrying the dead within are also powerful metaphors of death uh, by starvation. As if extricating art from amnesia, a number of artists such as William Crozier, Robert Balla and Brian Maguire, informed by Irish history, engage with themes of injustice, cruelty and abuse of power that characterise the famine. Themes that prevail in the growing gap between rich and poor in the world today. There is a sense that in, in, there is a sense in which a time interval is placed between a traumatic event and its representation. And to this extent, it is not surprising that the Great Famine had a long gestation to appropriate W.B. Yeats's phrase. But even allowing for the passage of time, the incapacity of mimetic realism or even figuration itself to capture the inconceivable horrors remained a frustration. Then modernism and the catastrophe of the First World War threw representation itself into crisis causing artists to look to abstraction, expressionism, and other formal strategies to deal with the pressures of reality. In the late 20th century, new forms of artistic expression um, and production, ranging from from time-based work, installations, video, and other innovative forms emerged. Many of these experimental approaches lend themselves to negotiating aspects of the famine that resisted conventional genres. The work of Huey O'Donoghue, Alan O'Kelly and Dorothy Cross suggests that it is through disfiguration rather than the ordering uh, illusions of mimetic art that disturbing areas of experience are rendered intelligible. In Huey O'Donoghue's On Our Knees, the landscape of the artist Mayo family around Loch Corrimore and Eris is imbued with inner life, feelings of attachment and yet alienation from the poverty and hardship that made living on the land so difficult. Reds, blacks and browns are splayed over the canvas like body parts in Brian Maguire's more expressionist, uh, more expressionistic The World is Full of Murder, conveying the impression of bodies piled on each other, mass graves on the earth's surface without even the dignity of burial. Much of Dorothy Cross's work is site-specific in that it uses found objects left on the surface of Western landscapes, debris cast off by time in basking Shark Kurok, the human and animal world are fused as if to compensate for the adversarial struggle between seemingly fragile Kurok boats and the basking sharks once hunted on the Atlantic coast. The notion of time being extended in the image is central to Alana O'Kelly's video uh, installation, No Colouring Can Deepen the Darkness of Truth in which sound, singing, chanting, sighing, breathing, keening, attempt to fill the void in images vacated by memory, as if the scarred landscape itself is lost for words. So, through pushing the limits of visual form, new ways of thinking about the past allow us to imagine alternative presence. To conclude, the question still remains, how can we, in the 21st century, find ways to remember a past that shaped our world as it is today? As we grow more distant in time, we can face it better, but perhaps understand it less. So the impossibility of giving voice to those who experience the famine, the paucity of material traces, because almost nothing remains, um, the scarcity of contemporary visual images and the subsequent oral and written histories create both challenges and interpretive opportunities that arguably artists best address. And maybe that's why the exhibition does appeal so much to people, that it's not reading hard statistics, hard facts, but it it allows people to enter into a relationship with the subject in a way that opens empathetic aspects of it up to us. So although much of the suffering took place beyond the visible, 
expressions of both the gaps and interconnections in Irish and diasporic history and memory lend themselves to exploration of issues of poverty, displacement and violence, as well as class, gender and identity in the contemporary world. For Paul Ricoeur, collective identity is rooted in founding events in which um, sorry, in founding events, which are violent events. In a sense, collective memory is a kind of storage of such violent blows, wounds and scars, as he said. And it is these scars that are given form in Coming Home, Art and the Great Hunger. Famine continues to be all too present uh, in the world. Such exhibitions offer opportunities to reflect on their political, economic and cultural ramifications. To some extent, at least, to succeed in art to express the intolerable is to triumph over the nightmare of history. To borrow Seamus Heaney's words, to provide a space where hope and history rhyme. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Neve.